So thank you all for being here. Um, Bill, okay, there we go, thank you. Um, this is presented in partnership with our library and Glendale Latinos Association. This is our fourth annual speaker series. And this year's theme is Latinos Driving Prosperity, Power and Progress in America. And all of our speakers, I feel like for us this year, the theme has been familia. We're keeping it all very close to the family, um, including tonight's speaker who um, is right here in our own GUSD. I'll, I'll introduce him in just a minute. But for right now, I'm going to let Aurora take it over and tell you how to do the translation. Bienvenidos padres de familia y estudiantes y gracias por estar en este webinario de Adelante Latinos. Acompáñenos a esta cuarta serie anual. Es el día de hoy y la próxima semana para aprender de renombrados profesionales latinos que sirven a sus comunidades de diferentes maneras. El tema para el mes de la herencia hispana de este año 2023 es latinos, lograr la prosperidad, el poder y el progreso de América. Animamos a ustedes, padres de familia, a sus estudiantes del quinto al doce grado, a participar en estos webinarios para aprender y aumentar el conocimiento de nuestra herencia hispana. Uh, si hay personas que necesitan escuchar en español esta presentación, haga clic, por favor, en el icono de interpretación y seleccione español. Muchas gracias y bienvenidos de nuevo. Thank you, Aurora. Appreciate you being here. Thank you to Glenda Unified for helping to provide the translation and all of the services with ETIS and through Zoom. So we're gr very grateful. Um, do we have Dr. Watson tonight or a video, Mr. Gallimore? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, I know uh, Dr. Watson has been at two of these and she's very happy uh, that we're doing this tonight. So uh, we're very grateful to her and to the board for um, acknowledging Hispanic Heritage Month and allowing us to to put these, these programs on for you. So like I said, it is National Hispanic Heritage Month, September 15th, October 15th, and we're very happy to be here. Um, this is our group of Adelante Latinos and Glendale Latino Association last year at the city of Glendale receiving a proclamation for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and we are going this year on October 10th to do the same thing. And um, it just means a lot to us that we're able to um, have our culture um, recognized and we're very thankful to the city of Glendale for participating with us in these achievements. This is our Adelante Latino social media. We would love to have you on our team. It's an, we are an all volunteer group. Um, even though many of us work for the district, we all volunteer these hours outside of the workday um, to help support Latino students in GUSD from ages kindergarten through GCC. And these are the videos we've had so far. Unfortunately, we had to uh, reschedule or cancel last night's uh, webinar. Uh, but tonight we have the amazing Dr. Oscar Macias, who's joining us and his video will be posted probably tomorrow or the next day on our YouTube channel. Um, I want to give a shout out to all of these people, Jenny and Tigran and Natalia and Marisol and AJ and Mar Marissa and Dr. Javier Guzman and the Glendale Arts and Culture, Glendale Latinos Association, our student moderators, all of our student clubs. Thank you to everybody, um, Francesca and Miguel and Brenda and Beatrice and everybody who helps us at Adelante. Also, Dr. Gallimore, who none of this would happen if he wasn't organizing it all. So thank you, Dr. Gallimore. And the moderator tonight is me. Savannah's unable to join us tonight. So it is just, you just get me tonight, but that's okay. We can have fun. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Oscar Macias, EDD. He's the GUSD Director of Equity, Access, and Family Engagement. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology and Criminology from California State University, Northridge. Go Matadors. He earned a Master of Education degree specializing in cross-cultural teaching from National University. He completed the doctoral program in educational leadership at the Rossier School of Education at USC in 2014. He started teaching in the Burbank Unified School District at Community Day School in 2000. There he taught all math subjects, nice, I love math, to the at-promise student population. 
Oscar has served as teacher on special assignment for BUSD for two summer schools where he was inspired to pursue school administration. In 2007, he entered into school administration at John Burroughs High School. During his tenure at John Burroughs High School, he has served as an assistant principal in the areas of discipline, guidance, curriculum, and instruction. In 2015, Oscar was appointed principal of Luther Burbank Middle School. During his tenure as principal, Luther Burbank Middle School was recognized as a golden ribbon, a gold ribbon school in 2017, exemplary arts education 2017 and 2021, exemplary career tech ed in 2017, Title I Academic Achieving School in 2017, and a California Distinguished School in 2021. In the fall of 2022, Oscar Macias made the move to district management leadership in the Glendale Unified School District. We stole him and we got him as the Director of Equity, Access, and Family Engagement, where he proudly works with a team that is responsible for providing coordination and leadership for culturally responsive education, family engagement, district and site level categorically funded programs, federal and state grant funded programs, and the local control accountability plan process for the district. I'm gonna move my screen because I can't see the words. Hold on real quick. Dr. Macias is an active member of the Association of California School Administrators. He has served as a charter president and was recognized by his peers with the Charter Leadership Award in 2014 and 2022. In 2016-17, he was recognized as the AXA Charter 15 Middle School Principal of the Year. Nice. Currently, Dr. Macias serves on the board of, of directors for the Burbank YMCA. He's also active in the USC Alumni Education Network, where he currently serves as an ambassador. In August 2023, Dr. Macias was named as one of the 10 rising leaders you should know in 2024 and K-12 Dive, a national newsletter and website provides an in-depth journalism and insight into the most impactful news and trends shaping K-12 education. He's a passionate leader that always advocates for students, parents, teachers, and other community members. He is dedicated to providing more opportunities for underrepresented students, which requires a commitment to awareness, community outreach, and involvement. Professional development around culturally relevant instruction and curriculum and purposeful and authentic family engagement. His educational philosophy is centered around the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. He seeks to overserve the underserved students who have been historically marginalized. And we are very thankful to have him. I'm going to hand it over to him at this point. The floor is yours. If you have any, for, I for, always forget this, Dr. Macias, I'm sorry. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom and we will make sure all of your questions get answered. Thank you so much. Enjoy, Dr. Macias. And good evening. And uh, thank you, Ms. Benitez and Dr. Gallimore behind the scenes and Adelante Latinos for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to um, talk and present tonight. Um, I will be very upfront and transparent uh, right away. Uh, listening to that little bit of a bio, um, real tough for me. Uh, and then sharing and talking about myself is also more difficult and challenging. But as I've gotten older, I've realized the importance of my story. And I'm hoping that, that my message tonight is that everyone here in this uh, room tonight, we all have a story. We all have a background. We all have an identity. Um, and it's important to embrace it and, and really live it and, and be in the moment every single day. So I'm hoping that message really is driven tonight. Um, I am grateful. Um, I shared before coming on live with Dr. Gallimore that yesterday uh, was my official one year anniversary in Glendale Unified. So I'm really proud and happy. Uh, I have a, a, a lot of experience in the education field. I've been very blessed with a lot of opportunities. So tonight's really about sharing my story and how my cultural identity uh, is really um, centered around my existence and my identity, my family background, and want to share. So next slide, please. I want to share with you what I hope to accomplish tonight. I'm um, going to give you my background in education, uh, my family background, and there are major uh, moments in time that have shaped my existence to what I am now, uh, personally and professionally. That is an early childhood moment in education, high school, college. Um, we've already kind of covered my education, but I want to touch upon that, hopefully inspire uh, our students who are here tonight and others who watch this later to really consider getting to the field of public education, K through 12. 
a really special, unique um, career that I want to uh, always recruit and get more people. Um, yeah, I wear a bow tie. I want to share that story. I want to explain more what the motto of overserving the underserved uh, means to me. And then again, as I mentioned, everything is about what's your story. I want to share my story and I every day try to be me. So I'm going to encourage you at the end that that's going to be my challenge to you is be you. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So I've had a very fortunate background in, and very diverse background in the field of uh, my own educational career. Um, I grew up in Pacoima, California, in the San Fernando Valley. So my very first school experience was at Montague Elementary. Uh, my parents, uh, being very uh, religiously based, devout Catholics, uh, enrolled me at parochial school. So I went the private school route uh, for grades one through eight, then went to a parochial high school in Sherman Oaks. And you can see the names on the bottom uh, of the schools. Uh, yes, Proud Matador, um, Cal State Northridge. I have a very interesting undergrad in criminology. Uh, I was actually in my brain destined to be an FBI agent or be a lawyer. And I uh, became an accidental educator, and I've been blessed ever since. Uh, National University, I got my master's degree. Um, and then I've been very blessed with the fact that I was able to uh, go to University of Southern California and got my doctorate in educational le leadership. And it's a, a program where I met one of my most influential individuals in my uh, life. And I'll talk about him in a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. All right, a little bit about my family. That is uh, Enrique and Bertha Macias to the far, or my far right. Um, when they got married down below uh, is a picture that's actually about a year old. My mom and dad who are still around, very blessed. Um, they are from Mexico. They were born and raised, they married in Mexico and then they made the gigantic leap and left their country, left their homeland and a lot of family to come to the United States in 1967. Uh, soon after that, my older brother, Enrique Jr., or he goes by Henry, um, was born. I was born later in 1972. I'm aging myself there. Um, and then my little brother was born later. Um, I openly will convey to you that middle child syndrome and tendencies do occur in Mexican American families as well. Uh, I have uh, many stories about being a middle child, uh, but I've been very lucky. My, my parents, um, sacrificed a lot uh, in my early childhood um, to give us a lot of opportunities. I will say this very openly, They're, they are my heroes. Um, they done a lot for my older brother, myself and my little brother. I, I wouldn't be around if it wasn't for their hard work and determination. And I learned a lot from them in terms of that aspect. And it's grounded me into the person that I am today. So um, again, uh, very heroic, the efforts that they did and what they uh, their story is more amazing than, than my story. Um, and, and, I, and again, uh, very heroic in nature. My early childhood, um, as I mentioned, um, I grew up in the early 80s, grew up in Pacoima, California, in the San Fernando Valley. Here in a nutshell is what my family life was like. It was centered around family. A lot of love, a lot of laughter, a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins. Uh, that's what my life was centered around. Um, that's all I knew. Uh, everything was centered around my uh, grandmother, especially. Um, I want to share with you that my first language, even though I was born here in the United States, um, being raised by my grandmother mainly because my mom and dad were working very hard to make ends meet, um, my first language was Spanish. I didn't begin speaking English until much later in life. And actually, I'll share that story in a little bit um, when I started my trek into public education as a kindergartner. So uh, my first shaping experience, and we can kind of go to the next slide, please. What's happened uh, in my first uh, uh, elementary experience uh, at Montague Elementary, uh, a school in Pacoima, California. And what I vividly remember, and I called it a shaping experience, and I shared that uh, my first language was Spanish. Um, I got yelled at one day. Uh, for not speaking English. And that moment really impacted me. Um, I, I learned through others who were in the classroom, told me after the fact what happened, 
Uh, I was told uh, by the adult in the classroom, we are in America and we speak English. Um, I didn't quite understand it, but I knew the tone and what was shared with me immediately. It transferred over as an embarrassment and shame. Um, I knew that it, it didn't feel right. Um, I used the word, it was a traumatic experience because it was. I was, at that moment, it was snack time, nutrition, and everyone got out to play, but I had to sit on a bench because I wasn't speaking English. Uh, it was an originating moment for me that I knew going back in time as I've gotten older, that is what drove me to be that learner that always wanted to be on top of everything, to learn as much as I could. And for this moment, it was, I got to learn the language of English immediately. And I remember uh, being attached to the TV, watching cartoons, watching anything that was spoken, uh, trying to be a sponge and trying to pick up words. That helped me incredibly. Also having an older brother helped me uh, shape that. But uh, as I see, uh, as I stated in the slide right here, it did lead to some unintended, unintended consequences later in my high school and early adult life. Um, next slide, please. So fast forward a little bit. Uh, my K or, or my first grade through eighth grade experience, uh, I was at a private parochial school. The same group of uh, students, basically, I grew up with from grades one through eight. Uh, we were all basically one little group unit and family. We grew together. We socialized together. Um, we were very homogenous, very Latino, Hispanic based, um, very comfortable in that setting. And of course, the church was attached to it. Uh, so it was a small community. High school came around. Uh, my older brother went to a private high school in Sherman Oaks, California. And for those of you in the San Fernando Valley, those of you around my age know that uh, Pacoima, the Sherman Oaks, there is a huge uh, socioeconomic difference. Sherman Oaks is much higher socioeconomic. Uh, it's a much different environment than uh, Pacoima, California. So he went to Notre Dame High School. I'll say it. I um, basically was led in that path as well, too. Um, and what a challenge that was for me. Um, socially. Um, so this phase in my life, we call it a cultural identity challenge. Um, the school in itself was not diverse in the student population. Um, I actually saw it less in representation of the faculty and staff. So for me, um, I felt it. I sensed it. I stood out. Um, so my transition socially was very, very unique and different. I felt out of place. Um, so I had to do something. I had to fit in. I felt like in order to, to exist and survive, I had to do some changes. So uh, in this phase, um, I over assimilated. I overcompensated to make sure that I fit in. And the unintended consequence, what I mentioned before was during those years of grades nine through 12, I basically was distancing myself, if in fact denying my culture and identity. I was uh, ashamed and embarrassed. I didn't want to be that Mexican boy uh, from Pocoima. I didn't want to sound like that Mexican boy. I really overemphasized how I spoke and articulated. I didn't want to have that accent. Um, I was really uh, being forceful at home and not speaking at home in Spanish. Uh, it, it was a huge moment in time where, uh, looking back, um, I learned a lot. Learned a lot of what not to do in terms of me and my existence and my identity. Uh, there was a, a, a very special transformative moment that I had where I kind of was awakened by my identity because of an episode that happened uh, I got the good fortune to play baseball. I love baseball. I still wish I was a major league baseball player to this day. Um, but baseball was something that was kind of life-changing from the social aspect. So let me share that story. Um, in addition to uh, tra the, the social transition, um, one of the things that I knew that I wanted to do was not give up my love for baseball. I tried out for the baseball team, made the team awesome. I created a new pod of friends that it, it 
extended my social existence. It helped out. I gained more comfort in my environment there. It helped out uh, academically fit in. Um, but there was a key moment where my identity was challenged and I didn't know how to react at the moment. So pictured in this slide are farm fields in Oxnard, California. And um, for those of you who are uh, athletes uh, right now, currently as high school students, you know you travel to distance places, play in tournaments. Uh, well, in this particular case, we were playing an away game uh, in Oxnard against o Oxnard High School. And we were on a bus trip. And it's a beautiful ride for those of you who know the 101 freeway. Uh, you see the farm fields, beautiful land. Uh, I always had a spot on the bus that I sat with uh, at, and it was in the front. I always like to be in the front. I always like to be the first one on the bus, first one off. I always like to sit next to the coaches too, because I always like to ask a lot of questions, a lot about baseball strategy and, and nuances like that. Uh, but this particular bus ride, again, shaped me, challenged my identity. So as we are riding in the bus, and there's about 22 players on the team, two adult coaches, um, someone in the back of the bus as we're riding, we're passing these farm fields, someone shouted out, hey, Oscar, which farm field is your dad working on right now? So that statement was made, and it was followed with a bus full of laughter. I was frozen. I was uh, stuck. I didn't know how to react. In the moment, I felt small. I felt ashamed and embarrassed. I looked towards the front because I'm seated next to the coaches to see if they heard it, to see if they were going to come in and save the day. And what was hurtful in that moment is I saw them laughing along with the rest of the bus. So extremely powerful, um, extremely sad because it made me realize, wow, I'm learning about the real world. I'm learning about how I'm identified by the color of my skin, the culture, my background, you name it. Uh, very powerful in time because at the moment, I didn't know how to respond to it. At the moment, I also knew I didn't know who to talk to at the, at the time. And, and that was something that I learned later in life was a mistake I made. So for those of you students in this uh, conversation that we're having right now, please, you have a moment where you feel crossed, you feel um, discriminated against, you feel less than because of an action that someone did on you, please seek an adult, seek advice, seek counsel, tell your parents. That was the one thing I did not do. What I did was I sat on it. I didn't even share it with my older brother and family, my parents. God, no, I didn't want to tell them. Um, what it did is it made me realize, man, I better survive high school. I got to get through this. And I assimilated. I overcompensated. And again, my continuance of that unintended consequence continued. I was still denying my culture, still not happy with my existence. And it was just I needed to survive. So I hid. I existed. I actually um, made friends. But once high school was done for me, I detached myself from that community. And then I fast forward later in life. Now I'm in the college mode. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. Cal State Northridge for me. My original undergrad major was business. And I was destined. My, my mom uh, wanted me to be a businessman, wanted me to own a business, wanted me. But the idea was you're going to go to business school. Um, and, and Cal State Notre has a, a tremendous, highly reputable business school. Uh, what they also had was an organization called La, the Latino Business Association, which I immediately signed up, found my community, uh, felt a real strong sense of pride. Um, but immediately in a Chicano studies class, as a freshman, intro to Chicano studies, I was met with another shaping experience. So an identity challenge. Um, existed there. So I call it internal and external confusion. In this class, it was a uh, full, a, a big class. I remember there was standing room only because people were on the waiting list. But here I am, I'm hearing people uh, mixing and people who knew each other and there I am. Professor stands in front of the class, icebreaker activity. Hey, everyone introduce yourself. High school you came from, 
and a little bit about yourself. So I immediately felt this like, oh my goodness, I think I know what's going to happen. And it was something that was already giving me anxiety. I'm hearing people from this neck of the woods, this person, this, uh, and, and it came my turn. And my turn was, hi, I'm Oscar Macias. I went to Notre Dame High School in Sherman Oaks. And the second I let that out, it was met with, ah, you're not really brown. You're that coconut. You went to the all white school. You're, you're uh, brown on the outside, white in the middle. So within that class, even though I had a close identification uh, with them, being Hispanic, being Latino, being in the class of Chicano studies, um, I wasn't brown enough. And it really resonated with me. And it was another shaping moment for me because at that moment, I think what happened was I was old enough to really kind of figure out who I was. And it started my transition to really digging deep about my family history, digging deep about my cultural history, digging deep about my parents' path to the United States and what they did and what they encountered. And, and I can briefly share, I remember so many moments of discrimination uh, and, and forgive me for using these words, but these were real words that were shared with me or in my um, witnessing of my parents, wet back, beaner, go back to your country, you don't belong here. Those are real moments in time that I saw my parents face. No reaction. They took it in. They, they, they weren't going to argue back. Uh, they were still proud. Um, it, and I had to live through that because I didn't know how to process that. Um, but come college, I experienced this. And then I had the re realizations with myself connect with my roots, um, which I never did because I was always having these moments in time. I wasn't sharing with people. I definitely wasn't having conversations with my parents until college hit. Um, it also coincided with the fact that I changed majors. This is when the criminology comes into play. Wasn't really happy with business classes. It didn't connect with it, but criminology and sociology did. Uh, and it was a great move for me because then uh, it kind of led to my path that I'm in right now. Uh, let's go to the next slide. My career. So this is important because at everything that I've shared so far about my upbringing, my shaping experience, uh, identity, uh, culture-wise, um, can all be connected with my experiences and growth as an educator. And I list my very first experience as a, as a public a school employee was campus supervisor. So I worked as a campus supervisor part-time during college. Um, and that's where I found my love uh, for being on a school campus, my love for teaching kids and connecting kids. Even though my official job title was campus supervisor, campus security, I was only paid for three hours. I found myself staying longer than I should have. Um, and then it, gradually it transitioned to me running tutoring clubs after school. Uh, and it led to my path where I got connected to a principal back then uh, who led me on my educational path and career. Uh, my first actual job transition from campus supervisor, I taught at a middle school in Granada Hills for a year in LA Unified. And then I transitioned to Burbank Unified where you heard I was an at-risk or at-promise teacher uh, uh, teaching math to kids who were um, not successful at the comprehensive school setting. Um, I was an assistant principal, middle school principal, and right now I'm really immersed into this new position uh, in Glendale Unified where I do get the opportunity to have um, a really uh, service role to help out all the school sites to make sure that funding is used appropriately and, fin uh, 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 and with uh, fiscal efficiency um, really making sure that we are targeting kids that we need to target for those who are needing most assistance and help. So uh, that all ties in because every experience that I've had, I've been able to tie in my identity. I've been able to tie in my story into each and every position. So when I was a campus supervisor, I was even, uh, really able to connect with the, the students who have been marginalized. Um, I worked at a campus that was largely Hispanic, Latino, um, and I saw these kids that were hurting, that were 
um, not really connected with the English language, immediately try to assist them, really try to get them the support. Same thing as a teacher. In every position that I've able to, to have, I was always able to go back on my experiences and it shaped me to the professional and person that I am today. I was made to feel a certain way by adults, by others. I want to make sure that kids in our system right now aren't experiencing that. They are. So my mode of operation, you have a, a principal of a great school and Ms. Benitez, other principals, APs, Dr. Gallimore, we are all working to make sure that every child that comes to any school campus is made to feel like they're welcome, nurtured, and ready to learn. If we hear otherwise, that's when we come in, we try to partner with your families and your supports uh, systems and make sure that we do the best we can to serve you. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So I mentioned that my parents um, are my heroes. And one of the things that uh, it's taken a lot of reflection. And even though there were moments where I was conflicted with my own identity or denied my uh, background and identity, what my, my parents did, and, and there's a beautiful picture, that, that's all the, the brothers and our spouses and families and grandkids. It, it, that's my family. That's my, my core, my unit, my pride. Um, I'm family first for those who know me, who work with me. I'm always going to be that individual that says family first. And that's the truth. Beyond being a family first, what my parents instilled on me was they were always, always strongly connected with their background. They were Mexican and they were very passionate about being Mexican. We had traditions. We had pride. Um, they were closely attached. That always made sure that we were a part of that. I didn't know in my early childhood that they were cultivating this cultural pride in us. Very appreciative of that. They've uh, directly passed that on with me. And I know that with my brothers in our family as well, too. Um, their path from being um, from uh, Mexico and then coming over to the United States. Woo. Uh, resiliency. They taught me that. Uh, they taught me the the the, the true uh, spirit of embracing work and being um, determined. Um, their their path of implied of sacrifice. I I can never. I don't think I'll fully understand. I don't think I'll be ever in a moment in time where I'll be able to repay them for all the sacrifice that they've made for us. Um, the one thing that they did instill with my brothers and I is they made sure that education was a priority, massive priority. They didn't have the educational opportunities that they provided my brothers and I in their home country, but they made sure that they instilled that being a path towards success. Living in the moment, embracing it, working hard, never feeling satisfied, never having that moment where, okay, that's enough, I've learned enough, always wanting to learn more, um, I remember, uh, for those of you that I'm going to age myself, um, encyclopedias was a big thing. I, one of the biggest things that I remember my parents sacrificing, uh, world book encyclopedias, for those of you in the adult world that are around my um, age and generation, that was a big sacrifice. That was an expenditure that I knew that they, maybe I didn't know at the time, but I loved. I Before there were computers and smartphones and all that, I was buried in encyclopedias because I wanted to learn. I owe that to my parents because they knew that that was knowledge and education. That was a path towards success. I mentioned the family first uh, concept. It was always family first with my uh, Macias family. Um, it made sure that we were connected. We always had that sense of community to this day. We are a family first family unit. Um, we celebrate together. Um, we uh, support each other in times of challenges and pain. Um, and with that, they taught me the idea of resilience, um, always standing tall, uh, making sure that we knew that it, it's going to take hard work in some moments, in some moments harder work than others. But facing adversity, not backing down, uh, that's Enrique and Bertha Macias to a T. And that is something that we strive for. Uh, openly, 
Um, I am deeply competitive with my brothers, uh, but that's because we want to, um, in my estimation, we want to make our parents proud to make sure that, hey, everything that you've done for us, here it is. This is why. And this is why I want to share this with you. Uh, but we do it as a family. And then one of the uh, last things, um, my parents, as closely attached as they were and are to their Mexican roots and culture and identity um, and the acts of discrimination they faced as adults raising kids in this new country, um, they balanced, they assimilated, they, they worked hard, they learned the language, but they never wanted to let go of their cultural background. Um, they're very, very deeply proud of that. So they taught me, and I didn't realize this because I shared my moments of challenge. Um, they taught me that it's you're able to balance tradition and adaptation. There's an image on this screen that I'm really attached to. It's really strong and powerful to me. I am American grown, but I have Mexican roots. I denied those roots. They were there. I was challenged with my identity and my background uh, early on. But this is something that I am endeared to. I'm very lucky and blessed. Um, I'm very uh, lucky that I not only was given this, this story and path because my parents worked hard, but I have this dual culture. I have an identity that's Mexican-American. I have the language as well, too. I'm very blessed to be bilingual. I didn't appreciate that, but my goodness, as soon as I hit college and I was able to really process everything, very connected to that, very connected to my background um, and my identity because of the fact that I am American grown with Mexican roots. Um, let's go to the next slide. I shared my career. I'm very blessed with all that. I have stories about each and every one of those moments in time. I'm really, again, blessed with the opportunity to share my story. Everything that I do on a daily basis is a reflection of my past, my, my edu education experience as a kindergartner, elementary, high school experience, college experience, um, uh, and even my educational background with USC and my educational leadership courses, which I'm gonna tie in a little bit. And as I mentioned, very lucky that Glendale Unified um, uh, gave me the opportunity to take on this new role of service in central district management. So I'm really enjoying my time and opportunity and challenges in the, in the realm of equity access and family engagement. Uh, next slide. Okay, I am wearing a bow tie and this is something that uh, is very um, symbolic, very passionate, very personal to me. Um, uh, the story of the bow tie originated with the gentleman that you see on the screen, and sadly, he's no longer with us. Um, Dr. Pedro Garcia um, immigrated to the United States from Cuba when he was 15. Uh, the Operation Peter Pan, uh, his mother and father uprooted him and brother, and they ended up in all places in Iowa. Um, he shared stories and he was one of my, he was the very first professor that I had um, at USC at the doctoral program. And of course he was wearing a bow tie, like you see in this picture. And the moment he spoke, the moment he started sharing his story, um, I was connected. I was amazed. I was literally hanging on to every word that he was sharing. I immediately felt this inspiration. So his story immigrant child, really out of place, had a tough time assimilating, socializing, had to learn the language real quick, also shared stories about culturally being disconnected. Man, I connected with this, this, this human being. Love him. Next slide, please. Along with being a professor of mine, um, he ended up becoming a great mentor and friend. Um, he was always available to talk. Um, office hours, phone calls. Um, I was always seeking advice. And one of the things he, he really shared with me, he shared a lot of uh, words of wisdom. Um, but thing that, again, that resonated with me that I want to share with this community, and it's true, you can lose everything that you own, but no one can take away your education. 
that tied in with how my parents really emphasized the path of education. Um, again, very inspirational. It meant a lot to me. It made connections to me. It, it made my um, path as an educator um, really more in tune and, and, and more focused on what I needed to do. And it was really validating at that moment. Next slide. So it, again, another nugget of wisdom that he shared and, and why I deeply uh, admire this man. Um, he made the following statement and, and it's one of the, the statements that he always repeated when I was in a moment of professional kind of uh, challenges and I needed to vent. Um, he would always have grounding statements. And this is the one that was my favorite. Um, you make your living by serving students, teachers, parents, district officials, and community members, but your profession is humanity. Um, so uh, uh, I love this. I live by this. Um, valuing the person that you're talking to, valuing the student that you're serving, the teacher, the, the parent, the guardian, you name it. We are uh, in public education all about humanity. So for those of you students here on this call and this uh, webinar, um, do, if you need more conversation about uh, the field of public education, do have a conversation with me. I, I want you to, to really at least entertain the idea of giving back and being of service, being a teacher. Uh, uh, it, it's a, an incredible, occupation and profession and it's one of the few that i know of at least um that does really serve humanity um i, I have a job i do have a job have a job title but i know deep down inside every day uh, in every role that i've had as a, a campus supervisor teacher administrator now district official my profession is humanity and i'm very proud and blessed to be a part of that um next slide So the significance of the bow tie, and, and it, it, it is a beyond the fashion statement. It's very unique and it's very different. Um, I've been doing this for about 12 years now, uh, and I do it very, it's a very symbolic moment every day. Uh, it's a self-tie bow tie. It's not a clip on. In the moment that I do it every single day, I go through this mindset process. You know, I just don't get ready for work and get ready. No, no, no. It's really for me. It's a grounding moment. But symbolically, what it does, it, it signifies my role as an educator, All right? I mentioned Dr. Garcia. I were to honor him and his legacy, a, a service, public educator, the fact that he was a mentor and uh, a friend. I were to honor him because he passed away as well, too. So it's my commitment to his legacy. Um, it, it's also a big reminder of my commitment to public service and education. Um, a lot of... Um, it's been a lot of politically trying times that we are in the midst of in, in uh, public education. I'm deeply committed to being a public educator. I love that I'm a public educator. My wife is a public educator. Um, I'm very blessed with that. So it's my commitment to that. It's a reminder to that. Um, it's also to honor uh, Enrique and Bertha Macias, my parents, my heroes, for their hard work and sacrifice. Um, not a day goes by where I'm not grateful for that. And uh, it, it gets emotional, as you can see. And the last bit for me, the reason why I wear the bow tie, it's a very big remind, my, a reminder of my purpose and my goal. It's something that I share with the department that I, I, I get to represent, Equity Access and Family Engagement. They've heard this. They see this. If you ever get an email from me, you'll see that as my signature line. I am going to overserve the underserved. Um, it is a sad reality, but we have members uh, and groups of the community historically that have been systemically uh, marginalized, and it's not okay. Um, I will do what I can through inspiration, through my own hard work, through working with others in partnership. I will do what I can to make sure that kids don't have an experience that I have where I am seen less than or differently. So overserving the underserved is a massive motivation for me. It's not just a slogan. It is a way of professional living and honestly, personal living. Um, injustices uh, are around us 
daily. And it's something that I strive for to, to be a part of uh, a movement, a district like we are in right now, that we're trying to do as much as we can to overcome that. And I'm very proud and lucky to be a part uh, of a public education system where I can be of service to do that. Um, next slide. I think we got a little bit left and I know we're short on time a little bit. So perfect timing. What I want to share with the community, what I somewhat failed early on and failed might be a little harsh word, but that's me being self-critical. What's your story? My story or my challenge to you, be you. I am very proud as I shared, American born with Mexican roots. I'm a proud Mexican American. I am very blessed that I have a dual identity from a cultural perspective. I have customs and traditions that I can uh, love and appreciate on both sides. So for you, what I'm asking you, and hopefully I'm able, I was able to share it tonight in this time together, please preserve cultural heritage. If you don't know what it is, find out what it is. Or if you kind of know what it is, dig deeper. You'll have a deeper sense of appreciation. Be tied in with your identity and your belonging. This will help you strengthen your family and community bonds. Um, once you do more of this, it will help. And I'm being very idealistic at this moment, and I'm okay with that. Um, this will help promote multicultural understanding. Bilingualism, if there's an opportunity for you to endear yourself, or embrace your, your uh, cultural roots with a different language, do it. Learn it. It will serve you well in this world from a personal perspective and obviously professional uh, job perspective. Um, embracing your cultural identity will help promote and celebrate the wonderful diversity, equity, and inclusiveness that we should be living in and promoting and celebrating more. Uh, and then lastly, uh, embracing your identity, knowing what your story is will add to your personal fulfillment and growth. So I think that's all I have in terms of sharing. Do I have another slide? I don't think I do. Um, I do. I actually created a QR code for those of you who wanted to have a question that we may not be able to answer tonight. Um, you can drop in your information there. More than happy to, to have a conversation with you, especially our students. Uh, any part of my story that you want more clarification on or just wanted to have a conversation about being a public educator, I'm here for that as well. So, uh, Ms. Benitez. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Macias. That was amazing. And, and you know, every night when we come together during Hispanic Heritage Month to do this, um, I'm always just so thankful at the presenters because you all have a story and it's a story we don't hear. Um, and and so I'm just so thankful to, to you and for sharing all of that because um, that's not, it's not always easy, right? Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for being authentic and for sharing your story. We do have a few questions. I'm gonna start with this one from Raheel who asks, do you think that we need more resources for diversity education in our schools? 100%. Uh, I, I'm a big proponent for that. Uh, but beyond the resources, what I will say to answer that is that we as a community, whether it's a local school community, a school district, um, a, a county a office of education, we need to be ready to have that space where people are ready and open to accept each other. And uh, reality tells us differently. Um, reality tells us that that we have some um, groups that aren't ready for that conversation. So along with the resources, what I would say is absolutely, we need more resources, but we need to have more uh, brave and vulnerable conversations to just say, this is me, this is my background, that's you, I accept you for who you are, mm -hmm. let's have a conversation about each other, and let's meet in the middle. That Everybody When that moment that happens... What's that? That, video, that video that we watched together about approaching conflict from a place of curiosity and not cage fighting. Yep. So I've been talking about that lately because it that resonated with me. Um, okay, here's one. Um, what is something you would change in our community or the world? Oh, wow. That's such a huge question. Besides um, traffic. Besides <laughs> traffic. Um, 
I, th I think that the one thing that I would love to change is something that can't be changed, sadly. And, then, and it's the ability to, to, to create mindsets for everyone that comes from a positive place and a loving place, uh, a place of acceptance. Um, and I know I'm being very idealistic in that, but it comes from the heart because so often we're faced with challenges. And I remember that as a child, as a student, um, even as an early college um, experiences is um, uh, I didn't understand always on the other end why I was seen differently, why um, my background mattered to someone because my differences made an impact for them for some reason. I didn't understand that. So if, if I had the ability to change one thing is someone's mindset to be open and accepting, um, plain and simple. Beautiful. Uh, do your children speak Spanish and how do you share your roots and cultural pride with your children? Yes, uh, not as uh, uh, grounded in Spanish as they should be. Um, and I'll be honest, uh, um, I'm not as uh, bilingual as I used to be. I can read it. I can understand it. But because I don't use it enough um, and partly is, you know, going back to my parents, it's amazing to real quickly how I communicate with my mother and father now, it is the most unique English, Spanish here, there, blah, blah, blah. So on both sides, we're having that mix uh, uh, messaging and, and language use. Um, so uh, I wish there was more, uh, even on my end, and, and for my uh, uh, two daughters, same. Uh, um, yes, they know it, they can understand it. One is a, 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 a lot more fluent than the other, um, but that that is something that, um, I wish we were more connected with. I remember um, when my mother-in-law was alive, we were at a barbecue and my mother-in-law only spoke Spanish forever. And at the end of one of our barbecues, she came out and she said, thank you for coming. And the whole party stopped because <laughs> we just weren't used to hearing her, you know, and, but she was learning and, yeah. uh, and it was just, it was, I'll never forget that. It was, we all just like mid, mid bite. We're, what did, what did she just say? It was, it was awesome. powerful. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, there was one up here that I was going to ask. Uh, what made you switch from sociology to education? Again, it was by pure accident. Um, I, I, to this day, remember her name. Miss Sherry Breskin was the principal at Porter Middle School in Granada Hills. Mm, I know what Porter is. And, um, she saw for some, and, and she, number one, she wanted to make sure that I understood I'm only paying you for three hours. Why are you hanging out so much? Um, but she saw me uh, connecting with kids and offering tutoring and really being of help and service. Um, you know, I was an earthquake student graduate. So I graduated a little later than I should have because of the earthquake and classes not being offered. But I also graduated uh, mid-year um, and what happened was I was going to interrupt you Oscar so those of you because you're very young who don't know the Northridge earthquake pretty much decimated CSUN and, and like the whole school had to be rebuilt so that's what he means yeah. by earthquake students <laughs> yeah sorry I forget uh, I'm aging myself again but but she um knew that I was a college graduate. I had, I had visions and plans to, to study for the LSAT and I was gonna to go to law school. And she said, hey, let's get you downtown, sign an emergency contract, why don't you teach class for a little bit? And I saw that as a means of raising money for myself and all that. I got an emergency contract, not your traditional route and fell in love with being a teacher and my path changed. So that's where it started from. Couple more minutes. Do you think that the distance from your culture and identity that it impacted you as a teenager still affects you today? Yeah, in, in some sense, yes, because I fear um, that I lost some years. I lost some formative years as a teen. Um, I think it impacted um, my relationship with my parents um, because there were moments, family moments, where um, I was in that deep denial of my identity. I didn't want to speak Spanish. I know that caused conflict. So uh, we've had moments with with my uh, I've had with my parents where I've come to grips with it, apologized completely, uh, was not happy with it. So yeah, it absolutely has impacted me to this day because I can't get that time back. What I can do is learn from that moment, 
and say, like, even right now, I'm able to share the story to say, that was me. That was my experience. Shame on me for doing that. But I've learned better from that. Um, what are your hobbies? Ooh, um, I deeply, uh, I love sports. Um, huge LA baseball fan. Uh, USC, obviously. Love music. Love concerts. Love traveling. Maui's my favorite place in the whole wide world. Um, but every hobby that I have right now is centered around being with family, my immediate family, my wife, being at home um, and the girls. And then I'm very lucky that my parents are five minutes away from me. Um, uh, so traveling concerts, but I, I love being around family. Okay. This has been asked a couple of times, so it must be a burning question, but how are you similar to another famous person that you know? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, uh, I, God, who do I know that's famous? Uh, I, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Um, how do you think a doctorate has impacted your career in education? Um, it, it opened some pathways. Uh, but what it did for me is instill this love of being a student. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it, God, I... I really wish I could be in that program all over again, which I know is uh, for those who have done it, uh, it was painful. I was able to do it as a high school assistant principal, but it re-inspired me to love knowledge and learning and the process and grind of studying, uh, writing, reading, and then the dissertation was a monumental thing. I um, am truly a geek at heart when it comes to that, and I love it. Um, I, it, it personally, it, it inspired me professionally. It opened up some pathways. Well, thank you, Dr. Macias. We really appreciate your time tonight. And, um, I know I've learned more about you and I, I, again, I truly, these are the stories we need to hear. Um, and, uh, so thank you very much. Um, we have our Adelante next meeting, Adelante Latinos on November 1st at Acapulco. Um, at five o'clock, you're welcome to join us. We'll be the loud ones. You, we are not easy. We're not hard to find. Um, and then we also have a fundraiser coming up, but apparently it's TBD. So we'll, that'll all be on our website. Like I mentioned at the beginning, five to eight o'clock on November 4th, Brand Library, Dia de los Muertos. Um, if you have a club at school and you want to um, create an ofrenda, you want to participate in that, um, please do so. Um, if you just want to learn more about Ofrendas, you can, or you can just watch the movie, Coco. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, Dia de los Muertos, uh, the Tournament of Roses, um, Celebration of Art, I believe that's due October 10th. Am I reading that right? Um, I can't 13th. see. October 13th, sorry. October 13th. Um, so please, uh, you know, let's knock the socks off of uh, Pasadena. That always makes me happy. And we have so many amazing artists in, um, in Glendale. Actually, my, my own daughter is going to submit something uh, for that. And I didn't have her do that. Her art teacher did. Um, and then just, you know, if you're interested in Latino Heritage Month and more activities, there are just a plethora of things going on. We're so lucky to live in Los Angeles. Um, and there's so many things. So feel free to go to the City of Los Angeles Heritage Month Celebrations website. Um, and there's just like daily, weekly things that you can do. Uh, so please check out, check that out. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Guzman. Thank you to all of our students and our teachers. Um, our next presenter and last presenter is next week. Last but certainly not least, uh, I think he was the first one I asked, was uh, Glendale Police Department Chief uh, Manuel Sid. And we are very, very happy to have him with us next week. So thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Macias. Have a great night, everyone.